You're listening to Business Talk Radio, where we take business to the next level. Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline connects you with experts from all over the world to help you take charge of your career, your business, and your life. Wrap along with us. Visit drjacqueline.com to learn how to become a guest or a sponsor. And now, the doctor is in. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to have you here today. This is our second show, and we're just thrilled that you're joining us from all over the world. You're watching Rapping with Dr. Jacqueline presents A Better You. Lessons from the best coaches, consultants, and trusted advisors. And wow, the two guys we have in the house today, I don't even need to be here, okay? They have so much experience. They are true leaders and true experts. They could just do this program all by themselves. So before I bring them out, let me just give you an overview about this program. This is not an interview show. This is a presentation platform. I have handpicked 25 people who I consider to be leading experts in their field. These are people that can make us better personally and professionally. How are they going to do that? They're going to present a 15 minute lesson. In some cases, the lesson is part of a series and they're developing their own playlist that we're going to be putting up on our learning portal which is being launched July the 1st. And you will be able to go to that platform and engage with their content and get certified on the trainings that they offer. So without further ado, let me bring out our two experts today. Mike Boisenot, he's joining us here from Connecticut and Hyatt Ives joining us from Texas. Did I get that right, guys? Yes, you did. Okay, yeah, good morning. perfect, good morning. perfect. Good morning. And thank you to Hyatt for introducing me to Mike. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with both of you. So as I mentioned, you guys don't even need me here. Uh, I just found out that you've together, you've been on, I don't know, triple digit number of calls. So uh, I'm just going to take a hike and I'll come back at the end of the show. <laughs> take the morning off. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so before we begin with the presentations, I always like to spotlight our guests and have you share a little bit of information about yourselves. Yesterday, Mike, I learned that uh, you have earned three Emmys, which is amazing. I hope you brought one of them today. I did, I did not today, but I will, I will in, the, in the subsequent shows. I'll put one in the background for you. Perfect. And you were with ESPN for just under 36 years, right? Yeah, that's right. And 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 being retired from there, you feel like you're you know you're ESPN emeritus. I feel like I'll be the, you know I'm, I'll be connected for for life. That's fantastic, and you're also an author. So I'm going to spotlight you, and if you would just share a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what you'll be presenting today. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be presenting uh, excerpts from a book. So uh, a book I wrote. Uh, I had many different uh, roles, executive roles, uh, senior management roles. Uh, at ESPN over the years, and I was uh, able to observe from some of the greatest people in the world to work with, and had access to some of the great companies in the world to also work with, especially the consulting companies. So I, I, um, I have a very high passion for leadership and management roles. And uh, so I wrote a book. I wrote a book called Soft Skills and Leadership, HR Insight for Managers. Uh, and I feel that it's an important uh, piece of a manager's role, especially early in their career, to learn more about the HR functions. Uh, it helps them to embrace and, and anticipate more of the HR work. It makes them stronger as leaders. And uh, eight of the chapters in my book, I, I go a little bit deeper into a particular discipline of HR. And I write it in business speak. I write it for early managers to understand and hopefully uh, bridge that divide. So that's one of one of the passions. Uh, otherwise, I'm just another media executive who's uh, out there trying to, uh, you know, put put our thumbprint on a uh, on a great media stream and digital property called uh, Rewirement Media, and we do business as Ali Plus TV. A L E E stands for a life ever evolving. We uh, we target 50 plus with lifestyle and entertainment uh, content in all forms. Fantastic. And yesterday you did two lessons, which was incredible. And I'm looking forward to uh, the fourth one today. So thank you for being here. 
And Mr. Hyatt Ives, who is really an expert in helping people deliver their message so that they have the most authentic experience representing their branding. He's a grammar expert. He actually edited my book. Thank you so much. And he's with Boomer Connection TV. He's also an author. So Hyatt, tell us more, please. Well, I, as you said, I am the author of That Ain't Not Right, The Use and Abuse of the English Language. And I'm going to, uh, I, I take that into being a communications and presentation expert. And I will be delivering a presentation on a foreign, another foreign language uh, that has influenced English. Last week I did the French language and you'll find out in a few minutes what today's language is. Woo! Suspense and mystery. I love it. Uh, and that was a great lesson that you gave on the French influence on the English language. And uh, also your newsletter uh, yesterday, I think it came out or sometime this week about words that uh, you should eliminate from your vocabulary. I thought that was great. Anything that's can't, shouldn't, but things that are all negative in, in uh, perception and the delivery of your message. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's every Tuesday morning. It's been in existence since uh, the first one went out October the 25th, 2016, and it's gone out every week since. Uh, that was the genesis of this book, and volume two of this book is going to be coming up this year. Oh, how exciting. Excellent. Of course, you're not sitting around. Either. <laughs> Both of you. <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah, as, as I told you, I, I've already driven an hour and a half and, and attended an a hour and a half uh, 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 Christian Chamber of Commerce meeting this morning. And then from here, I go to the dentist. <laughs> oh, the dentist, that's going to be fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, we wish... As, as, as they said in My Fair Lady, I'd be equally as willing for a dentist to be drilling than to ever let a woman in my life. <laughs> Well said. All right, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, Mike is going to present his lesson. And then we will uh, have a little conversation about it. And then Hyatt, you'll go. Sound OK? Sounds great. All right, thank you so much. Here we go. Stay with us, please. We're going to hear from several of our sponsors. And we'll be right back. It's what we do together that counts. The Big Alliance story. A true story about faith over adversity, perseverance, and entrepreneurship. Read Earl's story and how he became an entrepreneur. Available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible.com. For more information, contact Earl Hurd at earlhurd at bicalliance.com or call 1-800-460-4242. Hi, my name is Zane Carson Carruth, and I'm the author of this book, The World's First Tooth Fairy Ever. Reading is magic. Studies have shown that reading to your children lays the foundation for greater success in life. Reading helps develop language and vocabulary skills. It helps improve memory, and it encourages curiosity and inspires creativity. The benefits are immeasurable, and as a parent, you'll benefit too. In only 10 or 15 minutes a day, you'll be creating more memories and a bonding experience that will last for years to come. So take time to read to your children. Read them books about things that engage and interest them. Tales of fairies and magic fascinate children. And as everyone knows, the Tooth Fairy is at the top of the list. If your child loves magic, wands, adventure, and what child doesn't, you'll love reading them books from the trademark series, The World's First Tooth Fairy Ever. Follow along as Abella, the world's first tooth fairy, accidentally starts the tooth fairy tradition. Learn the tricks of being a professional tooth fairy in the book, Abella Starts a Tooth Fairy School. Your child's imagination will soar as you read the adventures of Abella and her magic wand. These wonderful books are available at worldsfirsttoothfairy.com and at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Walmart. Every day it was the same old story. 
I worked hard to make sure no one noticed what I was dealing with, but my stomach never cared where I was. And the pain just kept coming. After too many close calls and even weight loss, I had to do something. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation helped me realize what was going on and even helped me find a specialist. Don't hide your symptoms. Get help at SpillYourGuts.org. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. You're listening to Business Talk Radio, where we take business to the next level. Welcome back to Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline presents A Better You, Lessons from the Best Coaches, Consultants, and Trusted Advisors. Mike, I'm going to uh, go backstage. I'm going to put up your presentation, and then you're welcome to begin. Thanks. I'm ready. And thank you once again for having me uh, go through the excerpt of my book. And today we're going to talk through the empowering staff through education. In previous lessons, we've talked about org design, data and analytics, employee relations, and advocacy. Today we'll be talking about learning and training, which I uh, have titled here Empowering Staff Through Education. So a little bit of the prelude. These lessons are designed to give business managers a general understanding and a working foundation of the many disciplines that encompass business managing and the HR role. It's not meant to be an HR certification course. Instead, it is HR insight for managers. The content is contemporary, it's fluid, and some of the best applications of the HR and business management will be uh, mentioned. I will at times refer to human resources as advocacy. It's a term I recommend based on a very positive vibe, advocate, and the fact that human resources supports both business and human resources, not just HR anymore, advocacy. These lessons are meant to help business managers, often first or second tier managers with an inside look at the HR practice and tips for learning and applying some of them into their routines. They will make a manager stronger. So why? America has an endless number of small companies and major corporations, and we state this each and every lesson. We'll focus on both business and people. For example, the life cycle of an employee, the life cycle of an employee, typically you hear about the life cycle of a product, uh, an automobile or, or something manufactured. The life cycle of an employee starts as a candidate and ends as a retiree and may go through se several companies to get there. It's a very significant roadmap. But remember, Without rules and organization, businesses fail and the economy suffers. I'll talk about some of the theoretical practice and even give some endorsement for some of the best business or HR practices that are out there. So we agree that HR blends people management and business support. It's very important that new managers understand more of the soft skill of people managing because that can produce good results and grow leaders. Additionally, knowing how and where a business fits into the marketplace of any given company or industry will also strengthen a manager's acumen. So I anticipate participants on both sides, HR and business, that would participate in this lesson, and I hope to uh, each can embrace each other's specialty area. And I'll try to correlate the HR discipline with each of these. So today we're gonna talk about empowering staff, and when I talk about empowering staff through education, it's the learning and training plan. Successful companies understand how to train, retain and upgrade their employee skill set and competencies. They must do so in order to compete in such a demanding marketplace. So every industry offers challenges to keep up with technology. Everyone's going to be training on technology and secure their overall future growth. So in this session, we'll learn about the differences in learning and training. And we'll compare hard skills to soft skills. So a master plan is critically important to manage. The health of an, or, of an organization can be directly related to its learning and training process. So learning is associated with vision, risk assessment, value proposition, engagement, wherewithal, vitality, culture. Can't really put a finger on it, but you know it's there and you know it's important. Training would be best associated with technology, systems, operations, components, software or hardware application, testing, workflow. So let's break down the nuances of learning and training. A basic philosophy of learning 
uh, basically, uh, uh, let me go back, uh, is that a company needs to inspire the workforce, to collectively seek out information to make them smarter, more relevant, and creative. Keeping up with industry trends and technology uh, advances will inspire some to dig in and meet the challenges. So some people will take training and take learning uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as an act, as a, as a proactive act. Learning is about expanding the horizon into the daily routines. Bring the horizon into your workforce. And that will help to resolve issues easier and more effectively. Learning comes in many applications and formats. Uh, these include instructor-led, online, self-directed, certificate-based. Depending on the type of industry or the company or the role and the available resources, a plan can include a lot or a little. It can and it can always include as much learning as possible. Learning can be free. Many parts of the learning are actually quite inexpensive. Some are some are actually free. These include the ability. These include. The ability to follow good companies and experts online and on such platforms like, for example, LinkedIn. These platforms offer opinions, network solutions, open conversations, and sharing of best practice. Employees at all levels will make themselves more valuable to their leadership by initiating their own growth through learning channels. They will feel more engaged with the business if they keep up with industry trends and offer recommendations to their senior leaders on new standards and practice. Your employees will always know that something is working well or something's not working well because they're in, they're in the moment. Let's talk about training. Training is more regimented, predictable, calculated, measurable. It comes in such forms as end user training whereby a manual is issued. So there's a component, an equipment, a system. User goes step-by-step to process the ability to use and uh, do well with, with a piece of equipment or, or a workflow. There's a direct correlation of training and your bottom line. Many business leaders purchase and implement new equipment or systems quite frequently because there is also an expectation of efficiency, reliability, and relevant success based on a new piece of equipment or technology. Therefore, it needs to be worked well and it needs a, a good trained workforce. None of it can be realized unless the staff has access to train on it, be comfortable in delivering the product and the service in a timely and measurable new routine. Now we'll go to components. Components of learning and training will differ between industries and companies. There is some common ground at all companies. You must figure out what the proportion of learning and training and map it into your master plan. Depending on what company you have, how big or small, what industry you're in, You'll know that there's going to be a lot of training or there's going to be more learning than training. You work out that correlation. Most companies create or manufacture something for delivery and place a value on the services or output. This is true for media companies. I came from media background, which, can, which create content for consumption, news, weather, sports, etc., entertainment, as well as a steel factory, forges metals, creates beams for construction. How about a restaurant, an essential uh, place like a sandwich shop who feed people daily from a menu of options? There's a lot of systems that, that went, went to go into place in each of these companies. If there is a supply chain to create an output or a solution, then learning and training is important to employ. Training regimens are essential everywhere and are set up based on the industry and trade. So here's an example of working in an essential industry. And let's take a fine restaurant. The dishwasher role is connected to the maitre d', who is likely the highest executive on the floor of a working restaurant. How are they connected? Well, the dishwasher can see the trail ahead of him or her, and that may take several steps and experiences to finally get to the top role in restaurant, perhaps roles in prep, table service, event managing, maybe a banquet manager, and finally a maitre d'. There will be a set of expectations to meet. There'll be training along the way. You'll have to exceed those, and it could take years of progressive growth. It may also include transferring skills from one company to another in order to get to the role. It may not be in the restaurant that you start with, but it may be the role that you ultimately succeed to or ascend to. Similarly, a technician could be connected to a director of sales at a manufacturing plant. How will that person navigate through the process and stages to finally achieve the role that directs sales? Training plans and career learning, very important. Each position plays a, a vital role in the respective business plan. So the workforce needs to start up training and ongoing learning to be successful and grow. 
Most workers are generally interested in advancing, very curious about other roles. They may want to know what is out there and different about other jobs across the bench from them, down the line from them, in the next division that they don't work in. This is also part of what I call horizontal learning, horizontal growth, knowing what's further out in the division, the company or the industry at similar levels to yourself, but, but maybe a different role in a different routine. It's not always easy, but it's human nature to think that there's always something better in the wings. Horizontal training and horizontal learning is very important. The more dedicated a company is to keeping a workforce engaged in, the, in this manner, the better chances for measurable advances in a good company culture. Culture has many components necessary, such as diversity, strong communication, other factors such as employee engagement and happiness. We'll talk about diversity in another lesson, but it's important to know that the training and learning is a factor that goes into uh, creating a great company culture. It's important that the workforce know about company culture and add to it. How learning and training is delivered and, and, and why are a variety of methods so important? First, you must understand the differences in hard skills and soft skills. All employees must perform. Some will contribute to and maybe create physical products or services. Many others may be offering consultative practice or services, selling, marketing, delivering presentations to support the company. There is soft skills and there are hard skills. The balance of the roles that are individual contributor type will usually have more hard skill and the ones that are on the sales or management level may have more soft skills, the influential skills and competencies to draw from. So it's always important, uh, there are always exceptions to the theory, but usually based on the company or the size of the company and, and where the certain staff are and where the management are determines that level of hard skill and soft skill. The soft skills are generally blended with competencies. And these are usually defined by the type of business and expectation of measuring success. It's usually something that comes from within a person, a drive, a belief, a personality trait that sparks the process, lights the fire of competence. A common phrase to describe someone in, the, in this regard could be results driven. There's not a hard skill training plan for results driven, but it's a soft skill. It's something from within. There's a fire within. The term is easily understood, but you have to still put it into contextual evidence, facts, or data to support the case you're being made, that you are results driven. So why? We started here, we got here, and it's because of my ability to drive those results. Think of other terms that could be soft skill, competent, competency terms like team building, diversity, communication, leadership, and see how they may differ or get more intense as the workforce gains uh, experience and sets higher expectations for themselves. So under management roles, uh, the role of management in all levels of training and learning should start as entrepreneurial and inspirational. No better method than role modeling, leading by example. That's a great way to train in a soft skill, lead by example. Create the environment for learning and training, foster it, nurture it, cultivate it. Various roles are designed to lead as a team player. So example of a manager in a fast food restaurant, jumping in to help customers, jumping in to serve food, uh, welcome customers, seat them, get their drinks, work with the bar, work with the, with, the, with the kitchen. And it shows that the manager is not only involved, but respectful of the jobs that report up to him. Manager performs in the role of, sub, uh, of the subordinate and does so with precise action and efficiency. If you're going to do it, do it well. Don't jump in if you haven't uh, had that kind of experience because you don't want to fall. You don't want to falter as a, as a manager uh, in in the role of a subordinate. Something for the staff to live up to. When they see that, they know that their manager has their back. In other areas, such as a car dealer repair service, the manager leads by administering all of the value of customer service and organization. They bring you in. They make you feel comfortable. They explain what's going on. They they help that whole period of time to get you to rest assured your car's in good hands, go have a cup of coffee and sit in the waiting room while the mechanic who is literally trained and experienced and an expert in their craft is repairing the auto. Two separate types of training, two separate types of skills at work. Still, some managers are, are value added based on their ability to connect directly with a community. They may understand more about what the community is looking for because they have the cultural makeup of the community that they serve.
And again, that's going to be part of our diversity training as well. It's still others are highly skilled and highly skilled at managing and highly skilled at training, like a surgeon. A surgeon may have a staff that reports to them when they're in the OR, nobody better, nobody more experienced. When they're not in the OR, when they're when they're in their office off hours, uh, they are managing a staff. So they've got hard skills and soft skills. Set expectations for results. If you spend the money or the time to get your staff more training, are you following up? This is a good way to show engagement and trust that is required for the company to support such an effort. Make sure that your staff who is out there getting their training understands that there is a return on that and you're expecting them to deliver on it. So you wanna make sure that it's always worthwhile in the value of the training. Steer the learning and the training to hold true to your master plan. It's always good to forecast and, and make sure it works out well. It's a great opportunity to weave it into a performance plan. So if you're getting trained or you're, you're going on a learning platform, what is the expectation of how to use that on your in your role when you come back? Evaluate the effort and the, and the results and make sure that the engaged workforce feels more valued. The action steps associated with, with rolling out a good master plan and sustaining it will always yield a good mark for the work, workforce, satisfaction, retention, and potentially the management and culture will all, also uh, advance. And finally, the expectations of a good master plan should, real, should yield results. If the plan needs to be trimmed or cut based on economic or other factors, don't let that discourage you. Have the overall scope of it understood. Try to inspire and achieve the same results, albeit in an abbreviated fashion. But if they understand, your staff understands that you are working with, an, with, with a smaller budget or smaller resources, they'll understand that still proportionately, you're going to get your training and learning in. Good communication regarding tightening of resources can help in satisfaction and productivity of your staff. They're proportionally being trained with what's available. It's that simple. So you are empowering them with learning and training tools. They should be in turn building a better workforce. Simple way to calculate results. So what makes the workforce stronger through a good master plan of training and learning will ultimately strengthen you in your role as well. They also need to stay ahead of their competition, know that they're managing a, in a, more, a smarter, more effective workforce. That's what you have. So understand how to manage people better. Keep the managers training to engage them, inspire them, set expectations, assess effectively and often, even with, a, with an advanced workforce. Don't let the curve pass them by. Always communicate and organize the feedback. So that's our the high level of our lesson today. And as usual, we have a support center. And in that support center, these categories are very important for you to understand uh, where to go to do your own self-directed training. Uh, and this, this one happens to be on training. So the glossary, uh, the latest terms, know your, know your latest terms, stay on top of them. Periodicals, where's your business discussed, debated, promoted? Industry consultants, who do you follow? Who do you interact with? Who do, who do you interact with to advance your skills and your acumen? References, where's your playbook? And where are your training tools? Trade organization, who sets your standards for the industry? How do you stay connected? And continuing support, who do you rely on for mentoring or guiding or motivation? A couple of good books here for you, some good crucial conversation people to follow. And of course, uh, the, today the Perfect Phrases book will bring you some very good um, inspirational work for managers to follow. And as usual, I thank you. Um, on behalf of my uh, my team of one, uh, I thank you for listening in and uh, paying attention to the workforce management uh, group here on empowering your staff through education. And now I will take it back to the room. Thank you, thank Mike. You. Thank you so much. Uh, many great points that I wrote down. Uh, I just want to start off with LinkedIn as a, a, a tool that's available really to everyone. And it amazes me how many people don't use the tool. And uh, and if you could speak to the fact, I know that there's a, a ranking system somewhere in LinkedIn that you can see whatever category industry you're in, how you are against your peers. Are you familiar with this? 
I've, I've seen a little bit um, of that. Um, I haven't used the tool. I know that the tool is used when you are comparing yourself to candidates in a, in, a, in, a, in a job, in a role that you're applying for. And they will they will rank you against those peers. So it's probably within that same module of, of their um, of the talent acquisition piece that they have where you're searching for a job or you're putting keywords in to, to do a start your search. You can see where you rank. Uh, it's based on what what uh, what you've selected for your strengths and your skills, where your background is, and how your resume um, connects to it. That's a good. Uh, it, I think LinkedIn's a, a phenomenal database to to utilize, and I think you're right. Some people will underutilize it. I think it's uh, also called social uh, selling that you get ranked. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, question for you, and also for Hyatt, I really think there's a lot of value in LinkedIn, and I know some people have profiles, but they don't really update them. They don't interact with other people. What are your thoughts, gentlemen, on how important LinkedIn is for your business? Um, I'll just say that I, I, I think it's the most important tool that I have from when it comes to the social interaction with the industry, with your business, uh, the promotion of things. Um, I, for example, um, a half an hour before the show, um, I read a, uh, I read a, an op-ed, a piece from a friend of mine who was um, who is uh, an anchor at ESPN, Kenny Maine, and he's been there for 27 years. And Monday is his last show, and he wrote a he wrote a piece for the LA Times, and I saw I read it on LinkedIn, so I shared it with with my group on LinkedIn because it's important not only to use LinkedIn as as a good base for you know connecting with people, but it's also sharing. And when I say when when I say uh, references and people and who do you consultants in the industry and who do you follow. Uh, a lot of that following is on LinkedIn because I think that's the place where people will go to um, uh, push their business results uh, more than their personal results. And I think it's a very important uh, tool. Hyatt? Yeah, I concur with you up and down the line. And it, it is a way to uh, stay involved and stay educated and stay relevant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Good points. I'm also wondering when we look at training overall, do you see any connection between a customer relationship management tool and training? Meaning that as you grow in the, as you become a candidate and then you retire, let's say you stay with the organization, the team building aspect, the ability to move through your career, I believe is also related to how effective you are using a customer relationship management tool as uh, a part of training people who are on your team. This is what we're working on. This is what we're doing. Also training your leadership. This is where I need resources. Any thoughts on that? I yeah. think it's a great, if you, if you can have, if you have a good uh, learning and training plan, for your for your people and, and and be able to be flexible with you know based on the role and the nuances of the role to be able to um, kind of customize or personalize it, they will be more shocked when they go outside their company and realize how transferable that becomes mm -hmm. because that's a great it's a great opportunity the CRM is 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 is, is a great uh, database and, and knowing where people are where your customers are what their expectations are are you delivering have you you know, uh, if you can compare yourself in the industry and, and look at, you know, how people rate or or comment, you'll you'll know uh, how well you're doing as well. So there, there can be some instant, um, I'll say, uh, survey information that might come out uh, because people people can comment immediately. So you want to make sure that you you can always mitigate uh, the negative by doing a better job uh, for, with the customer service from the beginning. So utilizing the tools, if you can utilize the tool as a, like a CRM uh, tool in, in training, then l learn where that goes and how to find um, the success uh, on the other side. Yeah. If you use a CRM to set benchmarks, mm -hmm. uh, goal, you know, uh, mile markers, and it, it allows you to very quickly uh, realize you're, off, you're offline or you're ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. Yes. The CRM yeah. program gives you the the uh, the map, the guide, the guide plan. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I liked how in your presentation you talked about 
culture. And I like the examples that you used with uh, the maitre d' and the dishwasher and then a uh, fast food restaurant. Mm -hmm. So when you are in a position of management or leadership, you're basically training your people on how it is that they should act and how they're going to represent their brand. So if you are in a management position and you're not walking the what is it? Talking the talk, walking the walk. Like that. Talk, and you're yeah. sitting there just, yeah, you do this, you do, but you're not willing to jump in. That really says something. Yeah. There's two, there, there's a, a bit of a caveat that I, that I tell managers is if you came up through the system and you're very good and you did a really good job and you want to continue that, you, you want to keep that skill because it's, it's your, 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 your role modeling for your staff. That's a great opportunity for you to jump in, um, you know, uh, and 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 you, it shows support. It shows an endorsement for their role and that it's worthwhile. But don't jump in if you haven't been trained or if you or if you're rusty at times. You know, kind of pick and choose because if you don't do well, you could get challenged on that later. When you when you want to review someone later, they may say, "Well, I saw you stumble. I saw you, you know, break three glasses at the bar. Whatever that may be." And that example could be something that might come back a little bit later. So. If, and I think um, a couple, last week we had a, a presentation from Philip at the uh, British uh, Etiquette um, Society. And one thing he stressed was emotion, your emotional intelligence. You know, how are you uh, working in front of other people, whether it's the people that directly report to you or it's the community that's that you're serving and your your staff gets to watch you. So managers should understand that. And that's something that HR um, in the HR role, that HR competency uh, of emotional intelligence is very important. I think it's a great, uh, great opportunity to reemphasize that. Yeah, a good example is the the program Undercover, uh, Undercover Boss. I was just going to say that. Exactly. Yeah. Some exactly. of those guys that had come up through the ranks and, oh, hell, sure. I've, I've done this all my life. And they get out there and they haven't done it for the last 10, 15 yeah. years. They flub badly. Yeah. Yep. That's that is exactly what I was going to say. And I think there's a fine line between empowering your people and then uh, being a micromanager. So I, yeah. I think you have to have the training and then you have to know when it's appropriate to jump space, in. Right. Yes. Give, them, give them space to grow. It's, it's, I always say uh, uh, sometimes a good parent will make a great manager. Yes. Yes. Hi. Any comments that you have for Mike? Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> we know we know each other camera. very well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Great information. Thank you for a, a, an excellent uh, session. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. We're going to take another commercial break, and then hi, we'll come back with you for your presentation. Yay! Yay! All right. Stay with us here on a better you. Lessons from the best. Ooh, other way, I can't figure it out. Coaches and consultants and trusted advisors. We'll be right back. Have you just lost your job or have been laid off and you are looking to transition to a new job or career? Maybe you have even tried submitting tons of applications and yet you keep getting turned down for jobs you qualify for. Don't wait until you become overwhelmed with rejections when you can easily transition or get your dream job. Let MJW Careers guide you to the right career path and a better, brighter future. At MJW Careers, we know what hiring managers are looking for, and our goal is to land you the job you deserve. What makes MJW Careers a wonderful provider over other services is our pragmatic and scientific approach to resume writing. There are rules, there are visual cues, there are content best practices. We understand those and work within the boundaries to ensure our clients' messaging appeals to the decision makers. Our career consultants will help you transition into new roles quickly and effectively. With our experience in virtually every industry, we will provide direction in the frustrating job market by helping you write a customized, professional resume and prepare you for your interview as well. Join the great number of people we have helped scale up to greater things in their careers. Let us help you on your career journey. Come visit us, www.jobstickers.com to learn more and grab a free resume review or ebook. Meet the modern learner. Like most of us, the modern learner is short on time, on the go, and wants to learn on their terms and device of choice. The key is to meet them whenever and wherever they may be. The solution? 
best-in-class content served up by the Engagement Mobile Learning Platform, where the modern learner is at the center of the learning experience. For example, they can receive a text message that alerts them to a new learning module. They simply tap, watch, read and engage, or play a fun learning game. We transform your content into modules that are timely, accurate, academically rigorous, yet engaging and robust. Personality motivators are blended with modern adult learning principles to make it faster and more natural to absorb the content and have fun while learning. Our cutting edge platform offers something for everyone. It can be an immersive experience where learners explore and engage based on what's relevant to them in that moment, or they can follow a set curriculum, earning badges and tracking points toward a credit or goal, or they can dive deeper into high value professional content relating to their topic of interest. It's binge learning at its best. All this along with an entire portfolio of real time usable data and KPIs for stakeholders. Imagine share up to the minute news, enhance current curriculum, build knowledge banks, drive sales and foster community in the push of a button. To learn more or see a demo, please contact support at engagement.com. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. You're listening to Business Talk Radio, where we take business to the next level. Hello and welcome back to Wrapping with Dr. Jacqueline Presents A Better You. Lessons from the best coaches, consultants, and trusted advisors. Hyatt joined us last week and he gave us an overview of some of the words from the French language, which we have assimilated into our English culture and how we've used them. And today he's back to talk to us about the history and morphing of another language. Can I give it away? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> da da da! It's Spanish. So he's going to give us the history of some of the words that we've assimilated into the English language that are Spanish words, and he's going to talk to us about this in a number of different subject areas. Hi, are you ready to begin? Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm going to disappear, give you your deck, and put the timer up. Get rid of that. Hold on. Come on. Get get the whole thing there. There we go. Come on. Told him to give me slideshow. Give me slideshow. There we go. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Jacqueline, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you you all are in. And this is words that come from Spanish, English words originating from Spanish. And we're going to start this morning with uh, an, opening, uh, 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 an opening question and a couple of opening questions. They are, for some reason, my, there we go. What language has contributed over 10,000 words to our English vocabulary? Well, we've given it away. You, you, you don't know the answer. Of course, it's Spanish. And then when did all of this get formulated uh, or formalized? Well, it's in the mid, early to mid 1800s. In fact, the uh, English language, uh, we're, we're going to do an overview here. We're, we're going to start with the historical perspective of utilizing the Spanish language in English. We'll then move to uh, the influence of states and city names from the Spanish. We'll then move on to cowboy vocabulary, things in the cowboy vocabulary that are Spanish. We'll go on to arts and culture, and we'll end with food and drink. So let's start with the, uh, the historical side. 
English is one of many languages that uh, has a penchant for absorbing words from other languages. Many words that uh, English has acquired from Spanish originally came from uh, uh, other languages. And most of these are the Native American uh, languages uh, that were subjugated by the Spanish colonial empire. The present day California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Nevada, and Utah, plus parts of Colorado, Kansas, and Oklahoma, and Wyoming were all part of, guess what, Mexico until they were ceded to the United States at the end of the Mexican-American War in 1848. Although the change in sovereignty meant a massive influx of English speakers, it also meant that thousands of Mexicans living in this region suddenly became, you guessed it, Americans. Even earlier in 1819, Spain ceded their Florida colony, which included parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, to the United States. As a result of centuries of shifting borders, Spanish and English have had numerous opportunities to rub off of and to in influence each other. Here are just some of the Spanish words that you probably use every day. Let's start with the states. Montana. That's from mountains. So Montana means mountains. Nevada, snowy. I've not been to Nevada, but I understand that's uh, an, app, an appropriate uh, word for that. New Mexico, of course, that's New Mexico. These were Mexicans and they were in the New Mexico. Let's uh, continue with this state. Texas. The Spanish adopted Tejas from the language of the indigenous uh, Cato people, and it means friends or allies. So y'all come down to, to Texas. We are your friends. We are your allies. Arizona from the Spanish. Now, my Spanish pronunciation is not the best. So if I make some mistakes here, forgive me. It's from the uh, Spanish Arizonac, uh, an ad adaptation of the word, uh, what, Ali Sonac, meaning little spring from the local, uh, and I'm not even gonna try that, from, from a language of a tribe that was in the Arizona area. Then we have Utah. And this is uh, derived from the name of the indigenous Ute people by a Spanish Utah. So there we have the states that have been, in, have their names have been influenced by Spanish. Uh, we'll now look at some of the cities whose names are influenced by Spanish. Buena Vista, this of course is out in California. Good view, Buena Vista. You then go to El Paso, which is Texas, and that's the pass. The way to get from here to there. Go through El Paso, through the pass. Fresno, California, ash tree. I guess that's something that was grown out there. I'm not I'm not sure on that one. The uh, next one we, we come down to is Las Vegas. Now, I, I'm not sure what Las Vegas looked like a couple hundred years ago, but I don't know where they got meadows out of Las, out of that part of the world and that part of real estate. Anyway, that's what Las Vegas stands for, the meadows. Now there's this city. I'm going to let you read it because it's all in Spanish, but Los Angeles is the town of Our Lady, the Queen of Angels of the whatever it is, river. <laughs> so they, they were even precocious back then, you know, simple name, Los Angeles, and it's all of that. So that's California for you. Here's some more cities. Let's look at uh, Monterey, again, California, and that's the King's Mountain. The King's Mountain is Monterey. We then look at San Antonio, St. Anthony. We've got another San, San Francisco, which is St. Francis. 
And then, of course, you have Santa Cruz, which is Holy Cross. And that's, of course, uh, three, three California cities and one Texas city. Now, let's talk cowboy vocabulary. While nothing's more American than a cowboy, guess who are actually the first people to herd cattle on horseback in North America? They were the vaqueros, who introduced the ancient Spanish equestrian tradition to the Southwest. Their name is derived from vaca, the Spanish word for, you guessed it, cow. So the vaqueros were the cow handlers, the original cow handlers, the original cowboys. With that in mind, let's look at buckaroo. Buckaroo is a cow hand. I remember being called a buckaroo. You know, one of the workers, one of, one of, the, one of the people that, were, that, that, that made herding cattle possible. You then have corral which is a pen or a yard. You, you, put, you put those herds in corrals. And then you come up with chaps, chaparreras, leg protectors for riding through chaparral. And chaparral, of course, is the brush, the tumbleweed, the, 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 the stuff that could, can mess up your legs if you're, if you're walking, but especially if you're on, a, on a horseback. So there's, there's chaps and desperado, desperate. Outlaw, bandit, crook. So if you were if you were on the run, you were a desperado. You, again, you were a desperado because you were probably an outlaw, a bandit, crook, or some other ne'er do well. Here's some more cowboy vocabulary words. Let's look at hackamore. Hackamore, a kind of horse bridle. That's one I was not familiar with. Lasso. How many of us have had a lasso? And that's of course to tie. You tie things together with a lasso. You then move on to ranch, ranchero, a very small rural community. And if you think about it, you know, a, a large ranch is a small community. It's got everything it needs within its boundaries. So ranch is from ranchero, a very small rural community. And here are a couple more uh, cowboy words, rodeo. Rodeo, from rodeo, ro, to go around. And let's face it, most rodeos, you know, have round and around and around and around. So there's rodeo, and finally stampede, estampida. That's when uh, uh, the, the animals go wild. Uh, they, they get they get loose. They get scared. They stampede. All right. And here are our last cowboy word, 10 gallon hat. Well, as a youth, I thought, well, it was so big it'd hold 10 gallons, but then I thought, wait a minute, that's, that's not right. It's, it's 10 gallons is too much. 10 gallon is so gallant. So a 10 gallon hat is uh, a gallant hat, the hat that a gallant person wears. Now let's look at the art and culture influence of Spanish on the English language. Macho the property of being overtly masculine. You're gonna be a very macho man. And matador, of course, he is the guy that kills the bull in the bull ring. So that comes from matar. So if you, you had to be pretty macho to be a matador. So macho matador sounds pretty darn good. Patio, that's the inner courtyard. That's your inner courtyard, patio from Spanish. More arts and culture stuff. Plaza. Plaza is the public square. Pinata, the Mexican Spanish from the Latin uh, pin, pinea, pine cone. I got to do some research on that. I'm not quite sure how a pine cone became a paper thing with candy inside of it that you hit. And uh, Pueblo, a small town derived from the uh, Latin uh, populus. And then there are quincenera, quincenera, five year or 15 year, and that's a celebration for young women for their quincenera. Quixotic, derived from the name of Cervantes' famous 
delusional night Don Quixote. Food and drink, burrito. When was the last time you thought you were eating a little donkey? And then you had chorizos, spiced pork sausage, and daiquiri, named after the port city in eastern Cuba. There are more food and drink, and we have habanero from Havana. Habanero means made in Havana. Jalapeno from the jalapeno. And uh, mojito, it's uh, a sauce. And then our final three words, our final three words are nacho. How many of us have had nachos? Well, it's named after Ignacio Nacho Anaya, who is purported to have invented the dish in 1943. You then have the piña colada, piña colada, pine, strained pineapple. And finally, let's end with tequila, named after the town where the spirit originated. We actually looked it up on the map last night. It is on the west coast of Mexico, and it is the name of a town, Tequila. Come and join us in, in Tequilaville. All right, so there you have it. States and cities influenced by Spanish, cowboy vocabulary, arts and culture, food and drink all influenced by the Spanish language. Uh, going forward from here, there's a whole lot more specific categories, examples, specific industries and applications. You can also have your very own copy of that Ain't Not Right, The Use and Abuse of the English Language, which is where all of this started from. And finally, you can join the That Ain't Not Right, Use and Abuse of the English Language opt-in weekly email team just go to HyattIves.com to receive your copy thereof. And with that, allow me to return control of the meeting to Dr. Jacqueline. Well done. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm ready to travel, and I want to get a 10-gallon hat. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote down, look, I made a whole list here. I wrote down all of the words, and uh, I had no idea that these all had Spanish origins. Trust me, neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, what was the impetus for you to do this particular lesson? Well, of course, the, the genesis of, of it all was when I introduced myself to a networking group uh, some five years ago, and rather than, hi, my name is Hyatt Ives, I do this, 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 and this, I said, let me do what I do. And that is play with the English language. So I introduced That Ain't Not Right, The Use and Abuse of the English Language, which actually comes from my seventh grade uh, in grade school in the UK, where I was in a Jesuit boarding school and they had an annual essay contest. And I, as an underclassman, underclassman won for the entire school. And a couple of three years later, probably a little longer than that, I said, if the, Jes if the British Jesuits can recognize a skill, perhaps I ought to hone it. So <laughs> brilliant. This is, this, is, this is what you get from that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I wrote down, so a lot of drinks, vodka, yeah. uh, pina colada, daiquiri. I thought that was interesting. Things that I've had over, uh, not anymore, but I didn't realize they had Spanish origin. And the States. That was uh, and Patio Plaza and Piñata, when you mentioned that about pine cone, I was wondering if that's because a pine cone has all the different, uh, I don't want to say layers, because it's not really layers, but I could see how maybe something would be stuck inside. You might think it, you would try to pound it out of there. I'm going to have to do some research on that. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, the same uh, same with you. I did not study um, Spanish, uh, you know, having heard a lot of the, the terminology and, and, a, and a lot of the language over the years. And then when you start to break it down, um, it's so true. The Southwest is so heavily Spanish uh, influence. And I uh, same thing, I, I wrote a lot of uh, terms down here mm -hmm. so that I could follow up as well. But, you know, and then and it's easy when you see the explanation sometimes to, to go back and say, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, the names of cities and states because of the territories, but like the word plaza, I had no, you know, you, you know, you don't think about it. Cause I think of 
the plaza. It's a hotel in New York. It's, you know, the plaza <laughs> is the plaza. They realize that that came from that type of uh, uh, origin. Um, the only one that I, I thought about was in Arizona, Little Spring. I thought maybe because the spring is a short time because it goes from hot to hottest. Oh, wow. uh, I don't know. That spring. Yeah. No, I thought that, you know, maybe it was that spring or maybe it was, you know, something along the border, maybe something in the Tucson area where, you know, there's a, you know, a, a little spring and somebody, you know, the, the name stuck. But I think that's, that was the only one that I couldn't have figured out like intuitively. Uh, I don't know where that term would have come from, the little well, spring. Just, here's some lanyard. Do you know where the country of Venezuela got their name? No. The first, the rivers that flow into the Caribbean from Venezuela are heavily infested with animals and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the natives built their towns out in the river mm. on stilts. The okay. first sailors from Europe that saw that were Venetian sailors from Venice. Venezuela is little Venice. Mm -hmm. wow. as, they approached, oh. as they approached the, as they approached yeah. the river, they saw this town out in the middle, and I I, I know this because the, the, it was the story told me as I went to one of those villages out in the middle mm -hmm. of the river. <laughs> that was <laughs> so Venezuela is little Venice. That's I also so thought that Los Angeles was so interesting. The town of Our Lady, the Queen, and then the, that river. I can't say that, but uh, Lady and Queen, Los Angeles. So. So well done. Well done, gentlemen. This was really very valuable. Two lessons that we had here today. So thank you. And I know you're both coming back for more lessons. Hi, I'm streaming your banner. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? And again, how can they get your book? Hyatt at HyattEyes.com. It's H-I-E-T-T. -T. Like the hotels, just spelled differently. Hyatt at HyattEyes.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. And there's my phone number, 832-372-6900. That's 832-372-6900. Thank you, Hyatt. And Mike, how can we get in touch with you and how can we buy your book? The uh, the easiest way to get in touch with me is through is on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so, um, you know, if you just search my name um, on LinkedIn, you'll find me pretty quickly. And then... Um, the, uh, I'm on Amazon, so the, the book's on Amazon. So if you go to the Amazon bookstore and, and uh, search soft skills and leadership uh, with my name, you should be able to bring you right to it. And Mike, just a, a quick comment. When we talk about languages, your last name, I spoke to you about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. To me, it looks like it's a French name. Boisino. Mm -hmm. Boise, I don't know if that's the right way. Boisino. Like Boison. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Drink, I think. Yes. But it's, yes. It's, not, it's not pronounced that way. The Americanized version is uh, Boissonault, and uh, the French version is a little softer, Boissonault. And it is it is drink of water. The EAU is water. Uh, Americans oh. put an LT on it, uh, the Americanized version, but, you know, drink of water. Or as, as my mother-in-law says, a tall drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Boissonault sounds more German with the not. Yeah. not I think the the, if you took the a out if, I'm sorry if you took the l out it would it would uh, probably be more like that uh, middle european mm -hmm. All right folks there you have it we've just analyzed Mike's last name <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here both of you we've got another show coming up right after this fashion fitness travel and leisure and my co-host is Diane Floyd Bame and our guest is Tyla Lockwood. She'll be joining us from Australia. She's staying up to the wee hours of the morning to be on the show. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a lovely weekend. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Man. Jack. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. As I mentioned, we've got another show coming up. And so we have eight shows today. We've got five left. And we're going to end the day with the variety show. And Lori Mendelson is the co-host. And our guest is John Christian. And he is going to bring us to our knees with his beautiful voice. He's going to be singing Garth Brooks' song, If Tomorrow Never Comes. So join us. We'll see you back here shortly in less than half an hour. Thank you. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. 
when I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's, it's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage-free, fully adaptive, handicap-accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.